Hi everyone. May 10, 2019. <clears throat> Excuse me. These articles are very recent, like within the last couple of days or uh, the last few weeks. It's been now over six months since the campfire. Doesn't it feel like it's been years? So much has happened. So much has happened since November 2018 that it's really remarkable. It does not feel like six months, but an awful lot of people, an awful lot of people have not been able to recover. Six months after the campfire, life is not back to normal. Not back to normal. Campfire drove Bruce Arnold out of paradise, forcing him to leave his burning truck alongside the road as he left town. Now he's living in Oklahoma, but life hasn't returned to normal for him. The memories of the fire and the longing for home still haunt him. Arnold lived in paradise for 40 years. He had a good job and a well-established social life. Each day he had a routine of visiting with friends and having coffee, working at a job that that helped people save their homes from fire. And if you hear any background noise, well, just imagine two kittens having a lot of fun. Arnold still hasn't, still hasn't gotten used to his new life. Six months later, 64 years old, the course of his life has taken such a disorienting turn. His post drew <clears throat> on uh, Facebook, I believe. Yeah, his post drew dozens of comments from those who shared the same feelings. I'm sorry, uh, it might not have been Facebook, but does it matter? No. Does anyone else feel like they're in an episode of the Twilight Zone and you're living in an alternate reality? I don't even know who I am out here. I will say, well, you know, when you lose your life, you cannot, you can't fathom. <laughs> what it is until that happens to you and I hope it never happens to you but a whole lot a whole lot goes on populations of Chico and Oroville jumped about 20 percent over the past year uh, I'll get into Chico in another video Chico and Oroville um, but yeah those those cities of California are really experiencing the impact of the fires. I mean, it's not just the survivors. It's not just those who have lost homes. The ripple effect of these disasters is huge. We have a tremendous population living in campers, in RVs. You can see that as you drive around in this area. Fire displaced about 35,000 people. Um, it's, and there's so many who really desperately need housing. And FEMA trailers are set up, and more FEMA trailers are needed, but FEMA trailers, you really have to look into. Are they emitting toxic fumes? Because that's exactly what happened after the Katrina disaster. Um, all right. I want to let you listen to a few minutes of this woman, six months after the campfire, living in a motel with no permanent home 
and this is a woman who lives, Lori Peters Summers. She lives at Matador Motel in Chico. And again, this was posted yesterday. RVs, mother-in-law units, couches, spare rooms. Six months after the fire, many are still scrambling for housing, living wherever they can. North State Public Radio's Mark Albert went to the Matador Motel in Chico, where he met Lori Peter Summers, who's been living in a room there with her family since she was displaced by the fire. We had no clue the fire was there. My daughter was walking the grandkids to school, and somebody stopped her and said the school's being evacuated. So they came back home, and... I guess my daughter's boyfriend called and said, we got to leave now, pack now, we need to leave. I got my father up, he was sleeping. We went outside and it was raining soot. So we found one motel to go to and then we found this one and we've been here ever since. We, we've been looking for a home, we can't find one. I mean, we look daily, but we do have animals, and a lot of people don't take animals. So, that's our story. <laughs> We're still looking for a place, and my granddaughter's been transferred from um, Paradise School to Durham. So, she takes the school bus. They meet at Taco Bell, and she takes the school bus every day. How have you been able to handle you know, downsizing into a... A lot of depression, a lot of lost anger, because there, everybody's telling different stories about how the fire started. They were saying planes and this and that. We don't know what to believe, PG&E. We're lost. I mean, if I could put one word, it's lost. You don't know where you're going to go, where you're going to live, you had to make your life decision in an instant. I mean, that's the God's honest truth. It's like, where do we go? We don't know where to live. I mean, there's nothing available here, but I mean, there is maybe sometimes, but it's very expensive. We are lost. We're confused. We're, it, it's a feeling you'll never forget, and it's something if you haven't lived through it, you don't know what it's like. How about living in a motel room for it's six the months? Pits with five people in the room. There, there's clothes everywhere. I try. I'm a clean person, but I can't. I mean, like two days ago, I said, "Forget it. I just want to curl up in a ball." I've got my two granddaughters and my daughter and her boyfriend and. I mean, everybody's trying to get along together and stuff, but it's hard. I can't cook. I miss cooking. We, I got a barbecue with my money. I got a barbecue, and I barbecue when I can, and we have a microwave. And that's what, how we deal with it, you know, and go out. And I hate fast food. I hate it. <laughs> that's what I've grown into now, and... I've gained like 30 pounds because, <laughs> look at me, no, <laughs> I just want a home for all of us. I want all of us to be happy, a family again, and it's hard to do that when everybody's getting on everybody's nerves and it's, it's not right. I mean, I, I feel like somebody did this fire purposely. I really do. But it sucks. It really sucks. I mean, I feel what other people feel on Facebook because they're feeling the same way I am. I'm not alone. There are so many people that can't sleep and I, I can't sleep. I brought my, oh. By the way, I did get my husband. I have his urn in the room. Um, I didn't forget his urn. I remembered the dogs. And 
our family, and that's all that counted. That was Lori Peter Summers speaking with North State Public Radio's Mark Albert. So, fire in paradise, California, poisoned the water with toxic cocktail. So they have poisoned water in paradise, which even for those who didn't lose their homes, they're having to rely on uh, water that they get outside of their home. And this was posted April 18, 2019. And get a load of this. Endangered frogs delay cleanup in city ravaged by wildfires. Because you know, the officials are, well, they just love all species, right? Endangered frogs delay cleanup in city ravaged by wildfires, fears of harming these endangered frog frogs have forced crews to delay cleaning debris from about 800 properties, angering some residents anxious to start rebuilding their homes. Okie dokie. Insane. So, the principal of Paradise High School is resigning because he can't find housing after the campfire. Lauren Lighthall wears a lot of hats. He's a husband, a father of seven, but his most visible job, principal of Paradise High School. It was a very hard decision to make because you're the principal of a high school in a town with one high school. He and his family will be leaving Paradise for good, like so many others in the fire-ravaged community. We can't live in temporary housing year after year. The trauma has been tough because I've never really experienced it in my life. Lighthall said he's not immune to the pain felt among the rest of his community. That, too, contributed to his decision to leave Paradise. At some point, you're just being reminded of it too much, and everything becomes about trauma. And I think putting some distance from that is going to help. Yeah, when you experience loss on that kind of scale, everywhere you turn, every, every, <laughs> everything you do, even just talking to people and hearing their life experience and uh, it it's all a reminder very hard to live that on a daily basis morning paradise collective trauma in a town destroyed for thousands of residents the terror of sitting in traffic jams as the wildfire bore down left emotional scars. Everyone who experienced this went through trauma. We would expect to find a high burden of post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. And that's from uh, the Dean of Boston University School of Public Health, Dr. Sandro Galea. Nightmares, flashbacks in the immediate after math of a disaster are normal. So too are irritability, anger, hypervigilance, uh, problems with sleep and concentration, uh, all related to uh, the trauma and the stress of, holy shit, my life has just really changed. But when these symptoms persist for at least a month, the diagnosis can be post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Well, that's based on, you know, our field of psychology. But yeah, I mean, people can get PTSD. I mean, you want to talk trauma? Be rescued from 
you know, a, a tsunami of water that's coming at you, flooding your home or a fire, and you're sitting in traffic, and that fire is coming closer and closer. It's pretty traumatic. El, um, Alyssa Crane, who lost the low income rental she shared in paradise with her husband and her disabled adult son. The family has been staying in an insurance paid hotel since November as they search for an affordable apartment for themselves and their two cats. And now with temporary housing insurance about to run out, they're considering a permanent move to Idaho. People can't find affordable homes in this area. We are animals and our nest is very important to us. One of the most stressful things you can do to an animal is mess up its nest. Never heard it expressed like that. That is absolutely true. Martha, Martha Bryant's house was one of three remaining in a ravaged neighborhood. On her first visit back, she said she failed to recognize her own house. She continues to have nightmares, traffic jams, trigger panic attacks. What I remember the most is just the sheer fear and panic and my heart pounding. Bryant, 60 years of age, a third generation resident of paradise. Nobody was moving, and I was just screaming, move, move, get going, move. She said she knows she needs counseling, but life's been too full of other decisions to seek it out. Participation in community-wide conversations is essential. Sorry for the noise here. It gets very noisy. Uh, Friday nights with all of, well, seems that a lot of people like loud uh, cars in South Carolina and trucks with those mufflers. But getting together and talking to people on a regular basis, some kind of structured meeting with people that have gone through a similar experience it, it truly is the only, you, talking to people who have not gone through a similar experience can, can actually re-traumatize you and it could leave you feeling shamed, you know, an awful lot of people, oh, get over it and, well, you're still not through it, well, I no longer want to hear it and so just talking to people who've had this experience is essential to your well-being. Moments of connection and the sense of cultural familiarity that sometimes uh, made a big difference in terms of the emotional healing process. Carol Holcomb, she won't rebuild, instead looking for a home in a farming community with trees and in orchards which can resist a wildfire. I can't live in the forest again. I just can't. Six months still recovering, families in paradise, devastated by the campfire. On the surface, children from Paradise Elementary School appear perfectly fine, but shortly after an interview with an eight year old, Ellie uh, Robel, and her mom, Kyle, or Kelly, I, God, I'm, well, huh. yeah, sorry, I'm, my brain is definitely leaving me. So is my eyesight. I'm going to have to start blowing up these pages to read it, but six months of trauma <clears throat> flooded through. Ellie and her mother's home was among those reduced to ash by the fire. They've been on the move ever since, recently settling down in a donated RV. Children silently battle their fears so their parents can worry a little less. Students not only miss home, but their friends too. Mm. 
and I saw this video and I I don't know what the hell is wrong with people. Yeah, Kansas teacher kicking a five-year-old. Okay, so more than 1,000 families still searching for homes six months after the campfire. But that is a number that they've been able to come to, but there were so many who were living off the grid or uh, living in you know somebody else's home. The number is more than a thousand. Even before the fire, there was already a severe housing shortage and a growing homelessness crisis in rural, rural Northern California. We're really lost. We've really lost our ability to produce housing that is affordable to our citizenry, and this is the larger tragedy. That coming from Ed Mayer, director of the Butte County Housing Authority. We've lost our ability to produce housing that is affordable. Wow. What does that mean? It means we have an awful lot of people, landlords, who are incredibly greedy. My family is gone. My community was my family. And this is coming from a woman named Dominica Sprague or Sprague. Um, my family is gone. My community was my family. It's the sixth place that she and her family have moved to since November. She's now at the Yuba Sutter Fairgrounds in Yuba City, California. And moving and moving and moving and moving, it does a number on you. I don't know how to describe it other than it's complete chaos. We haven't felt safe anywhere. Fire survivors can't seem to cut a break either at the Yuba Sutter Fairgrounds, it's $750 a month to hook up and use the showers. $750 a month. You want to talk greed? I'm sorry. It's right smack in our face. So the Sprague family have to move again because uh, most places don't let you stay more than a month. Where they will go next, she doesn't know. There's no place to go. We were looking at parking on the side of the street with a bunch of other homeless. Many survivors like Sprague, who says she relies on Social Security for income, were already living on the economic edge before the fire. To hear them tell it, there's growing compassion fatigue in this already stressed region. There are stories of price gouging when it comes to campgrounds or possible rental units and harassment directed at those who park their RVs on area streets. According to updated numbers from, the, from FEMA, about $85 million <clears throat> dollars in aid has been distributed to close to 8,000 campfire survivor households with another 370 million in disaster loans distributed since late last year. But how many were displaced 35,000? And well, there's a lot of people who are not getting helped. Federal and state officials are now building temporary parks and communities to house hundreds of survivors in FEMA trailers. Oh, please tell if you know anybody who's going to be getting into a FEMA trailer. Oh, they need to find out if it's toxic. While the official estimate is that 1,000 more units are needed immediately, it's widely believed that the actual housing need is higher. Stephen Murray, he's seen as a savior. You know, I hope for all of you who asked, what can we do? What can we do? I hope you pay attention 
to what other people are doing so that it could give you ideas. Stephen Murray, he's taken it upon himself to raise money and help other victims. A typical day for Murray starts just after 6 a.m., his phone buzzing with text from desperate people who need help. He tries to prioritize the asks that he knows he can deliver on any given day. At a storage unit outside Chico, one of four in the area, he has crammed full of donations. Murray unloaded a pair of new mattresses, still wrapped in plastic and looking for a home. I don't know what I'm doing. I just know that people need me and need the support. They need to see a smiling face every day. And that's what I try to give them. And this is... This is... Uh, Stephen Murray, who has just every day been trying to help people in need. Uh, Murray, who used, used to manage a mobile home community for seniors in paradise. That was leveled by the campfire. Uh, everybody seems to know him. Today he raises money for victims on various GoFundMe pages and is starting a nonprofit to help survivors. He also posts videos to Facebook Live at least once a day asking for donations and updating the community on his efforts. On a recent post, he streamed from a Home Depot parking lot asking for donations to help him build a ramp for a local woman who is in a wheelchair and suffered severe burns trying to escape the fire. In a later stream, he looks weary and tired and urges his followers to stay positive and work together. It's not like we were given a book that says when your house burns down, you lose your car and your job. Here's what to do. We're just kind of playing it every day as it goes. You don't need to know. You just need to get started. One day it's Costco. Um, and he's going to buy fans in bulk. The next day, it's helping a former neighbor who's mowing, who's moving, sorry, moving, uh, moving tow a camper up Interstate 5 to Oregon. It's mind-blowing how some of these people are surviving and trying to get through life right now. He and his young family have moved several times or seven times in the last five months from Sacramento to Granite Bay and multiple places in Chico plus Reno and Sparks and Nevada. They're currently camped out on his fiance's stepfather's property about 20 miles north of Chico. Himself, his fiance, and their two young kids are sleeping on the same king mattress. If there's been one constant nightmare throughout this entire disaster, it's the housing crisis. Housing crisis. So proposals to build FEMA trailer parks in the Chico area initially faced resistance from neighbors. Um, only one large site to house 400 trailers in the near nearby town of Gridley is currently under construction. A proposal to build tiny homes did win recent approval in Chico. The mayor of Chico told NPR that they are scrambling to find housing where they can and having to make up emergency housing plans as they go. As scary as that sounds, it's just a world that we have to get used to. It's the new normal, guys. So Sprague, Sprague, Sprague. She's looked everywhere in the area for an affordable place to rent. There is nothing for families like hers on a fixed income. I don't want a handout. None of us want a handout. But this has made it impossible for anyone to survive. Six months after the campfire, this family is still far from finding a new home. The, uh, is it the Porter's? Animal sanctuary, a car, a trailer, park near a brothel, all are places where Jennifer Porter, her two parents, and their ten pets have slept since they lost their homes in the campfire. We aren't willing to split up because we are all we have. When you have families that are strong, it absolutely makes the difference. 
she was a former, 35 years old, Jennifer Porter, a former emergency department nurse at Butte County's Feather River Hospital, which was also partially scorched. Um, the Porters among 32,000 people who evacuated. At least 1,300 people who are still looking for permanent, stable living accommodations. But these are the people who have been accounted for. And a lot of people left the area. They're not part of this. Um, dozens of other families are still in hotels, living in tents. But the Porters, they want to stay as close as possible to Butte County, where they once lived and worked. And I will tell you, stay where that place is most familiar to you because the stress of ending up in places that you know no one, no one knows you and uh, nothing's familiar the cultural differences well you find out that they're big it only adds to stress it adds to your stress, it's hard so you know, the rainy spring flooding that occurred in paradise. Last time it rained, the water was up to my third step in my trailer. So you open your door and you're literally in the middle of a lake. So they go from losing their house to a fire. And then the flooding that occurred. Her parents, Linda and Stephen Porter, set up their own used trailer just feet away. Her two aunts, family friends, and all their pets are at the park with them. Stay strong stay strong. They keep each other laughing. They grill food at night and browse on their phones for houses to buy. So Jennifer Porter is looking into getting a loan, government loan, to buy a place for everyone to live together. Uh, getting settled down in a new home will help her figure out her new identity because who I was is gone. It's like starting over a whole new life. Doesn't know if she'll return to paradise. She's just trying to find stable ground. And trauma is an everyday thing. Crisis level housing shortage hurting Chico. City of Chico's population swelled by more than 19,000. Many of those people are still in Chico without permanent housing. Um, to a visitor, Chico's Main Street fits the perfect picture of a peaceful college city. Well, pervasive trauma, however, underlies this otherwise seemingly average spring day, which marks six months since California's most devastating wildfire broke out 25 miles northeast of Chico. Uh, Butte County Housing Authority, Ed uh, Executive Director Ed Mayer. Here, six months in, we're really seeing our second wave of displacements. A lot of temporary housing facilities that people had um, secured, either through FEMA or other resources, privately or publicly, after six months, those transitional resources go away. So now what? So it makes Chico the fastest growing city in the state of California and people who live around paradise or who did live around par paradise in the small communities um, low income elderly and or living with disabilities moving out of Butte County is a financial impossibility for many victims. Oroville saw its population grow by more than 4,000 what has become clear after six months of recovery is that an end in the trauma and rebuilding is not in sight. Even people whose homes were spared are impacted. Wendy Porter knows this firsthand. I had a very good friend lose their house, and so he and his family lived with us for about four months. Porter, man managing director of Chico Store, a nonprofit profit tech startup incubator that has helped more than 200 business owners displaced by the campfire. Now we're finding that the time that they need help is lengthening, 
lengthening. It's not just a six month problem. It's going to be two years, three years, four years. We're finding that in order to keep these businesses here locally, we really need to give them the help they need to rethink their marketing strategies, go into different markets. There's a lot of survivor's guilt. Chico is one of California's few full service cities without any city sales taxes. Plans on polling Chico's residents in coming months about whether they might consider adding a city sales uh, tax to help pay for some of the expanded services. Well, we'll see if that goes over. When you look at an estimate on that increase in population, you're looking at probably an approximately six million plus needed for additional resources to serve that population. Uh, the state has promised, well, I would get that in, in uh, you know, get a signature on that. The state has promised to backfill property tax losses for Chico this year and for the next couple of years to the tune of one million annually. Everyone we communicate within the community is being impacted one way or another, if not directly, then indirectly. And I'm sure the people in Chico, some are getting very tired of being inconvenienced because of the traffic now that exists in Chico and just not wanting to deal with uh, the burden of 19,000 like overnight <laughs> the additional 19,000 Chico is trying to make it easier for people to create more housing the city is allowing homeowners to convert buildings on their property livable space for 20 Five percent of normal cost also authorize some administrative permits to allow people with larger plots of land to host RVs and campers. So you can watch this uh, six months after paradise. Hundreds of cats rescued. Many have been um, reunited with families. Those not reunited, they're looking for permanent housing for the cats. Well, I'll leave you with this uh, video. And there is a lot, a lot of uh, ways in which we can help one another. It just means, you know, putting in the time and the effort. Clock, a father and son now have a new place to call home nearly six months after flames from the campfire changed their lives forever. It's all thanks to a group of volunteers led by a woman who knows exactly what they're going through. New at 6, CBS 13, Steve Large shows us the amazing move-in movement. We're so blessed. It's gorgeous. I mean, we couldn't ask for anything better. After, After six, six months, months living in homeless, homeless shelters, a simple, a simple set of keys, keys means so much. So much. Yeah. yeah, the keys to uh, our, our brand new life. Luke, Luke and Colton Morrow now have a place to call their own after the campfire wiped out their mobile home. Just, just want to thank everybody who had a part in, in building this tiny house, house especially Alyssa. Alyssa. And they built all the railing. Alyssa, Alyssa Nolan, Nolan knows what it's like to lose everything. everything. In, 2008, in 2008, the Butte Lightning, Lightning Complex fire destroyed the home where she lived with her eight-year-old eight son. Building, building tiny, tiny homes has, has been a learning, learning process. process. In, in the beginning, I didn't even know the difference between a drill and an impact driver. Nolan asked for donations and volunteers. Their hard work paid off. This father and son are ready to move into the first finished product. Thumbs up. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Nolan, Nolan thrilled to see Colton exploring the 200 square feet he'll call home. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. Absolutely. And, uh, a gift. Alyssa Nolan, Nolan has eight, eight homes now under construction and plans to build more while also raising, raising her three children and working a full time job. She's a busy lady. People wanting to help can find more information on our website. That's at CBS13.com. Okie dokie. All links are below. Have a good night.